Hello and welcome to Japan Expert Insights and our Business Insights Forum. Every Thursday, Tim Sullivan and I, Maya Matsuoka, lead a discussion looking for insights, developments, and new opportunities for the business in Japan. In this podcast, we welcome comments, questions, and opinions. So if you haven't done so yet, join us next time. In the meantime, you can find us at japanexpertinsights.com and our YouTube channel, where we upload all the discussions on Japanese politics, business insights, and the Japan's role in the Indo-Pacific region. Today, we're going to talk with Giovanni Boyedo, Chair for Frontier in AI Education, Researcher, Mechanical Informatics in the School of Information Science at the University of Tokyo. The topic is the Avatar X Prize, the contest, and why it is important for Japanese startups to participate in the contest. Jovan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Maya and team. Thank you so much for the invitation. So let's do like a organic continuation of what we have been talking before. And we have covered so far, like why robotics was a, it's important culturally in Japan and then the different aspects of um, a, the a cultural influences and somehow a little bit of uh, other uh, XPRIZE, for instance, and things related with robotics happening uh, recently here in Japan. But uh, we, we came to the, uh, the Avatar X Prize, and in conversations we found that the concept of Avatar, it's multicultural and I, I want to say multi-temporal. It, it means that in different time points might change the meaning a little bit and also depending on the culture. So inside one country, let's say Japan, for instance, maybe the meaning has been evolving and it has not been exactly the same and also parallel meanings as well. So that, that's something that I, I would like. I think is is very interesting and we're going to relate with technologies that are happening now, company, Japanese companies and Japanese uh, activities that are happening around this avatar meaning and in the different in the different uh, concepts that are happening. So very basically, I, I want to start with the very origin of the word avatar. As far as uh, as I could uh, research, uh, just very quickly, it, it's an Indian uh, Hinduism. From the Hinduism, it's a concept that it means descent. So it signifies the, the material appear appearance or incarnation of a deity on earth. So this is a, basically a, a deity that a god that has an incarnation on earth on our reality. That's by the meaning of, of the Hinduism. Uh, the avatar is in Sanskrit, uh, so that's what it was taken from the the word, and we adapted mostly to technology. So uh, I will be covering. Uh, it's gonna be um, kind of go uh, go and for and come between Japan and US. Uh, the meaning has been evolving. Uh, the itera iterations that has happened in the recent years, basically. So as I, as I understand, and I was uh, having conversations with different people. There are kind of two, sorry, three different meanings right away, the parallel, parallel meanings of avatar in Japan. So one strong uh, correlation of avatar is made, is made, is given because of the concept provided in Ghost in the Shell. So Ghost in the Shell, uh, it's a Japanese uh, media that that was a series uh, illustrated by uh, Masamune San, and the manga uh, started uh, in 1989, and the name was The Ghost in the Shell. So this uh, this was the origin of, of how people, many people think now, they correlate the meaning of Avatar <clears throat> to the concept of Ghost in the Shell. So Ghost in the Shell basically is a story of a, um, a brain that is found and the brain is uh, has a lot of memories but is completely uh, combined with mechanical and robotics parts so the body can be uh, taken like you can switch the arms and get a new arms or legs or uh, the robotic skeleton uh, the humanoid shape of a robot uh, you can control it uh, with the, the the brain that is that is combined with the mechanical or technology so that's the the basic uh, technology, science fiction inside the Ghost in the Shell. So science fiction, um, I'll tell later that it's not that far away right now. Like maybe 
1989 when it was first published. It, it seems like, like wow, that's the future for sure, uh, like far, far away. But uh, now, uh, with all the advances that I will be talking about a little later, it doesn't seem that really far away anymore. So The Ghost in the Shell, there has been also different movies, uh, not just a manga. And uh, I think the Japanese uh, anime, the first one was in 1995. And there was an adaptation, an American, very recent one in 2017. So these two movies uh, uh, basically tell this, the same story uh, from the, the manga. And it's the same story of these capabilities of the mind controlling other things. And the main plot, uh, I don't want to, uh, well, if you're interested, I really recommend to watch or read the manga or watch the movies. Uh, but basically, it, hacking, hacking the brain and hacking the mind of the, the brain that is combined with the, with the technology is kind of the main plot, how uh, other cyber attacks can be even made in, into this the mind itself of a, of a person. And that's uh, um, something yeah, something very interesting that, that also might be a problem in the future that I will kind of explain later. But Ghost, uh, these cyber brains, which uh, the technology allows uh, they, these brains to interface their biological brain with various networks. And also the, there's kind of a level of cyber station where uh, it could be like simple interfaces, minimal interfaces to almost complete replacement of the brain uh, with cybernetic parts in cases of cerebral trauma. So that's the concept of the science fiction uh, of of the, of the movies and the, and the manga. So these cyber brains uh, are kind of happening, uh, start to happening in a way. Uh, there's a, a concept con called the brain computer interface and also exoskeletons. So I want to mention first like, exoskeletons. That there's a, a Japanese company that has been uh, doing these exoskeletons more affordable and more popular from working, for instance, in the airports in Narita, the workers, uh, they have to lift a lot of very heavy loads. So they use these exoskeletons. So it's something that literally you put on like a suit, you put on and then you get more strength in your, basically in your legs because the motors are a uh, help in the movement. So when you get up, you get lifted also by the, the motors attached to the suit. So it's kind of an extra, extra legs, if you want to say that, or extra muscles, um, like muscles that you don't spend any energy on. Uh, they are disattached. Uh, they are outside your body, but they help your body to live. So this is, these exoskeletons are being used recently in different ways, even in a, for like uh, a older people. So in these houses where other people live, uh, there's exoskeletons are being have been used so they can leave the patients, leave the elderly and take them to the, to the bath or take them to wherever they have to go. And, and this strength that usually has to be like a, a very strong person, it's not anymore. Uh, you don't have to be that strong to lift, to help carrying on people from one side to another uh, because of the, uh, these exoskeletons. And, and there are, uh, there's one, at least one Japanese company that is very successful in that. But this, coming back to the cost in the shell, the main concept uh, as we talked was the, the cyber brains. So the cyber brains uh, uh, basically is the collection of the, the memories that one person has, plus the awareness, plus uh, the ways in which you think. And if, if everything is coded and everything is uh, as a function, there's, there's uh, I want to make a parenthesis, there are researchers uh, really, putting together uh, models of awareness. What is what is really consciousness? So there are several computer scientists that go into this problem of consciousness to be modeled into a mathematical way. So in general, in science, uh, in general, it's believed that everything could be made as a function. So if you can make a, a, anything as a function, you can replicate it, or you can model it, or you can put it into a computer. So if you can understand and you can model uh, the, the consciousness, technically you can program it or you can at least use the hardware to load your memories or to load your capabilities, abilities, personality into a hardware. So you can use the hardware uh, to continue having this awareness and continue having these memories. You don't need a biological brain, neurons, 
to keep doing that. Uh, but hardware uh, memories, seems, uh, etc., can replace the biological uh, neuron activities and uh, neuron functions that are uh, in our brains. So there's a, a lot of attention recently in a company from Elon Musk, uh, that's Neuralink. And Neuralink is um, it's a company that is making new sensors that they go inside the scope and they they made a um, they a perforation on the skull in the skull and they put the sensor so it's a very high density uh, a sensor that is connected to a processor uh, by your ear and then when you think something uh, you can cap uh, capture the waves the brain waves very in very uh, precisely and then these wavelengths wave, uh, wavelengths can be uh, coded into anything so you can control uh, by thinking by thinking you can control computers so this is um, one step for this the cyber brain uh, I, I would say one of the very first steps cyber cyber brain uh, made uh, talked in the cause in the shell the ability to uh, control external things could be could be anything could be just a type typing for instance uh, to more advanced like arms or moving legs uh, by just by thinking you don't have to move any more muscle and just just concentrate in a mental activity and then you sensors capture the waves of the neurons neural activities and then they translate it into into the computer commands so this this neural links is a, a, has had a lot of attention recently uh, and I, I want to mention very briefly also about Ray Coswell which he also predicted that in 2000, before 2045, uh, most of the ghost in the shell, ghost in the shell cyber brain might be possible. So he, it's interesting that he put a, a date on it. So basically uh, his main ration, his main theory is about the singularity. Well, inside the singularity, there are many aspects. And one of the aspects is this cyber brain, ghost in the shell cyber brain possibilities. And he has mentioned several times, according to his calculations, that before 2045, there's going to be a ghost in the shell capabilities. It's going to be possible to put all your memories and all your personality and your level of awareness into the hardware. And from the hardware, you can control anything. So, so this requires many breakthroughs that we need to do. I mean, society has to do. And but there's there's a path like. It's uh, um, it's happening little by little. We are seeing ways in which this goes in the shell uh, concept of the cyber brains. It's happening, and as I mentioned, like there's a, a parallel meaning of avatar in which uh, many people consider an avatar as as kind of a cyber brain, a ghost in the shell capabilities. So that's uh, uh, something that. Uh, yeah, I want to make a pause here. If there's any any question or comment, I would be so happy uh, to to hear about that. I think Tomoko. Uh, yes, I just hello, Tom. Good morning. Thank Good morning. Good morning. At least I can say it's that if anybody interested in the ghost in the shell in Japan, um, Amazon Prime is giving the free if you pay for the Amazon Prime, so that you you can watch uh, from there. Oh, very well, nice. Thank you so much. Thank nice, you. nice to know. Yes. Janel, hello. Good morning. Oh, hi. Thank you for sharing all these amazing insights. Jovan, I was just curious if you would be able to kind of share some resources where people might be able to read further about some of the innovations that you've mentioned. Yes, yes, sure. I will. Uh, maybe if the, I think the shortest answer would be uh, feel free to DM me. In, in here and I can I can put I was trying to put in my profile uh, the I made a little presentation about this with some links to it but uh, I, I can I can send it to you uh, uh, or to anyone who who is interested and uh, for sure I can share it uh, Clubhouse has a little has a limitations of not being uh, very friendly with the extra resources sources but uh, I think uh, for sure just DM me and uh, I can share uh, all the presentation with you perfect I will do that thank you Yes, thank you. Thank you. And also, Yuka, hello. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Oh, good, good morning. morning. Thank good you. Good morning. Thank you again for Jovan for the great, you know, discussion about this 
very interesting topic, and I have so many questions. But uh, for the interest of time, um, so because we have talked about Avatar, um, I'm sorry. So this may be a little bit, you know, outside of the scope of the topic today. But I just had a chance to, you know, play with VR, virtual reality, and my question is. Do you think it's gonna go further, like uh, to the realm of meta? The question I'm asking is, um, you know, so the you know you can see the avatar, uh, you know, through what do you call those glasses or lenses you're wearing, but uh, it's really fun, and I can see so many applications. But you know, so much that I can like I put up with wearing these glasses, and I was almost getting like a seasick. So what is your take on, you know, these technology go beyond just uh, maybe having fun or just have a brief meetings? Thanks. Thank you, Yuka. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, that's a very, very good question. Uh, and I think it's very well related with it, today's subject. Uh, so what this meta, uh, this uh, uh, previously Facebook uh, with the Oculus uh, device, you put on, on your head and it covers all your eyes is this a side vision the vision field is uh, so you got you whatever you move your eyes the uh, display so it's complete immersion and this uh, oculus obviously uh, this virtuality in which you are immersed once you put it on and, and you are open your eyes and you see the display and whatever you move the camera in the virtual world moves accordingly and you feel you are kind of uh you are your brain he thinks that you're inside a, a different a different world so i i agree completely there are many different disadvantages like uh, it's a heavy thing it's it, it's on your way it's not very natural it, it gets you sick like seasick as you said and there are um many disadvantages but uh, uh it's very fashionable now in as i can see in, in not just in japan but also in different countries uh, especially america where uh, this trend of the meta universe, um, which by the way, meta, uh, this, just the name meta, is such a uh, legal pain <laughs> that uh, has been a battle for many companies just to own the name beta. And I just read a couple of days that Facebook is spending too much money just to get everything, like all the copyrights that has meta. But it, it, it has been a long legal battle before Facebook started. But this meta, meta world, uh, it's, has many potentials, as you said, the, the meetings. And that's exactly a, one of the a, a applications that I was going to talk. Uh, so an avatar, an avatar uh, you can also, for instance, there are some companies who want to teach, like uh, like you were, for instance, in, inside Harvard or something. Uh, so I heard a few years, few years ago, a company who wanted to do that, like to put in a real Harvard a classroom, to put a 360 camera, and connected with very uh, high-speed internet. So anyone in the world can just get into the Oculus, let's say, uh, and you get into the Harvard class and you see around and you have classmates and you can see the teacher in the front or the professor in the front and you get a feeling that you're inside a class, uh, the classroom, taking a class in, in Harvard, for instance. So this kind of level of uh, immersion might be possible uh, to simulate. There's a, There was a research paper that found that these virtual worlds, it was very recently, I think a couple of weeks ago, they, find, they found that people with many fears, uh, they get so much better uh, kind of treat psychological treatment when they use virtual worlds. So there are applications that we're finding that they're very useful for, for this. And obviously the meetings that you mentioned, the business community have been using it. There's a, there, was, there was a very popular uh, 3D world called, uh, application called Virvela here in Japan. And that that was by uh, default, like in your browser and your computer, but also it could you could connect with the Oculus and you can you can uh, be immersed in this world and having meetings, business meetings, who wherever it is in the in the virtual world, it could be in different could be in the next room or could be in a different country far away. So so these these virtual meetings are really happening and there are different companies, not just Virvela but also Mood Up and and also uh, other ones uh, that like build bitway events that many congresses for instance and ac academy academic uh, reunions and meetings are happening uh, virtually and some of them are using 
uh, these virtual worlds, uh, not just Zoom, but also like this Moodop or Virvela or, or these virt, uh, Virtaway events. So this, this, these companies are really putting the, the technology to be a very useful case. Uh, and what might happen in the future, I see some trends in which it will not be that heavy device outside your face. It may be integrated kind of just glasses. Uh, there's a lot of uh, gossips, rumors that Apple is going to be making a, an eyeglass for augmented reality. So it's going to be as easy and as, a, as portable to have eyeglasses. And then you will have a certain level of immersion that you can see through the glasses, but also you can have a, like elements of virtuality and you can manipulate data by the Inter that the feedback that your glasses are giving to you. So this is going to be, uh, I think, a step forward in this AR, VR world uh, and industry. And, and there, there will be many applications uh, that I think for me, the, the most exciting ones is learning and business uh, because uh, solving different problems of uh, presenting media in an immediate way, the digital way where the students can learn. And also when you meet people, for instance, even even if it's a physical meeting, but you, everybody is using these AR glasses. They can share data very easily and, and uh, they could see the concept, for instance, or they could see graphics um, more in a very more natural way than uh, just having to look at a, a screen or something. So, so I think it's, it's going to be, it's getting more and more important. And Oculus has to evolve, it has to be more portable, it has to be smaller, lighter, and also more affordable. It's a little expensive for for being democratized. So this this is the maybe the concept. Like the step to democratization hasn't happened yet, mm -hmm. and possibly where that's where Apple is going to kind of uh, put the foot on and make a kind of an intermediate step, in which is the the Apple glasses, uh, which is going to be like more augmented reality than virtual reality, but it's a, a step towards the same objective. Okay. Um. So yeah. So. I get that. So the device can be improved. I, th I think it has to be improved, but uh, it's just too heavy and then too bulky. And you said it's fashionable and maybe I'm too old to understand the fashionab fashionability of it. But so the application you mentioned meetings. So I'm sorry, I'm just play playing the devil advocate. So what kind of enhancement you can get by, you know, the having these devices when which you cannot get through, for example, Zoom? You said, you know, like a more realistic or maybe you feel like that you are there uh, because I just cannot. Okay, I get that. Uh, I just cannot believe there must be something more, right? Otherwise, Facebook will not spend so much money in getting, you know, this metaverse naming right. Um, can, hey, Yuka, can, thank you for your comments. Jovan, if you don't mind, let me just kind of jump in. And, and this is just from my perspective, sure. and I don't know anything about any of this, but as we were talking and Yuka, when you asked your question, like, what are some of the real practical things you can do? My mind didn't go to meetings because I kind of am in your camp. I mean, how much more is it going to offer than a Zoom meeting, right? If it's just, if you're talking about a business meeting, but be, someone who was in the automotive industry for a long time, involved in many concurrent designs of, in my case, it was parts, you know, components for cars. Um, I remember seeing four years ago now, um, it was a Microsoft um, promotional video about VR. And yeah, you wear your glasses, but engineers from all around the world are standing, you know, virtually around this. How would I explain it? It's like a hunk of clay that they're going to mold into a car. And they can do it by hand. They can do it digitally. And everything is automatically updated into the database. And so in essence, you're all right there looking at what looks like a car and you're designing it concurrently together around the world and you know it may have been an exaggeration you know um just to promote the technology but in my mind that's where i saw some real world practical applications that not only allow people to work remotely but it gives you entire freedom to experiment with designs so i saw it you know as both raising quality and raising efficiency so i don't know if that's answering your question in any way Jovan, maybe you want to add to that Oh, thank you, Tim. I think it's very, very good uh, uh, answer, and in, I can complement the answer as well. That uh, uh, from a business point, for instance, I'm very uh, like, uh, like also very related with what you said, Tim. For instance, there are some when you are pitching, let's say, a, a pitching to investor, and you have a product, so you you want to show the product, and obviously you can bring the product 
Uh, but there's some kind of a more impact way if the product can be moved around, rotated, scale down, scale up, scale down uh, intuitively. And if you can do it by yourself, let's say like an Oculus or with future Apple lenses, you will have the ability to do uh, whatever you want. Like you want to move the scene from uh, from the front, from the from the bottom, from the upper side. So this interaction with the product um, it's going to be very impactful for investors. And I'm telling you this uh, because I've been also, I was involved in a company that we were developing interfaces for the blind. And the, uh, there was a mechanism for getting information to the blind. And this, uh, it was so hard for investors to to understand the concept, like how, oh, like how? And, and I just noticed when I brought the prototype and they could feel the prototype, they said, oh, wow, I understand now. So in, in the same way, if you want to do like a scaling presentation, for instance, for hundreds of people at the same time, uh, having this kind of uh, object floating in front of you and you can interact with it and move it around, uh, change the size, et cetera, uh, it's going to make you, um, it's going to make a more impactful uh, presentation. It's going to be more impactful, uh, uh, like go to the point of what you, you are doing in your product or your service. And it's not just about for products, it could be for services also you can, Throw, tell the story of the persona, the pains that have they have, so you can uh, share like how they're going to be the service, and it doesn't have to be very physical. It could be like also digital. So there's a lot of potential uh, applications for for very very well related with what you say, team. Demonstrate uh, the concept in a more intuitive and more uh, easy way to to go to the, to the point of of the object or the service. I wonder if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. Great. Thank you, Timothy and Giovanni. Those are the great points. So, okay. So let me just say, I'm sorry, I'm taking up too much time, but uh, let me see if I can understand your last point. You said this device that you have presented to your investors, this device help the blind or visually impaired people to see things? So maybe I misunderstood you. Oh, yes. Well, yes, I'm sorry. I think, uh, yes, that, that's correct. So this is another topic, but my, my comp the company I, I was involved, we made um hardware in which blind people could kind of like a, a quotation c quotation they could see so it, it means see by tactile so uh it could be like a whole presentation but basically it's representing a characterization of pixels into pumps of air that have different pressure a temperature and a pressure and frequency so there are three variables uh, frequency pressure and temperature that each single point and it is like around one square millimeter. Uh, imagine like you have a matrix of, of is 100 by 100 on a kind of a half of the iPad size. And that half of the iPad in that size, you have 1,000 little points and each point has is pumping air in different frequency, pressure, and temperature. So you can characterize the digital information, digital images onto the display uh, for the blind to interpret and to see, uh, quotation, see, quotation. Uh, so they can understand the data in a visual, the visual data in a tactile way. So that, that was the concept. But you can see what I wanted to say is like, uh, instead of bringing this device to the investors, because just explaining that uh, many, most, I would say 99 of them, 99% of the investors, they just didn't understand like, what, like, what, what is that? They, they couldn't grasp the concept of a, a person understanding images by the hands or how it's possible. But when they, Tortured the system, and they went. They saw it physically in front of them. They they understood right away. So it's more like uh, it's even like more than one picture is worth uh, one thousand words. It's, it's even like I guess like one virtual reality uh, object could be uh, worth one million words or something like that. Uh, if you could digitalize the object and also present it and manipulate and rotate it and somehow play with it in a presentation, for instance, uh, that that could be so much more impactful that uh, just um, even just pictures or, or just, or it could be even more than uh, the physical object. It, it really depends case by case, but um, yeah, uh, this device uh, for the blind could make the blinds understand the uh, information, the the images, but uh, on, on this virtual world like Oculus and and all the Bivella and all of this, you can present things and show them to everybody. And, and if their people are using Oculus, uh, they can feel immersed and the, the impact of this object or this service uh, product could be even higher, I believe. I wonder if that makes sense. Okay, great, thank you. Um, 
Oh, yes, yes. Going, well, if you're interested more about how you can give the, the good business pitch, then just go to Tyra Crowley's YouTube series. So that, because, you know, he is the um, organizer of serial uh, business pitch in Scott, Stockholm, and he's going to start doing in India from next year. So he knows the best pitch, how, how you can actually do the uh, good business pitch. But anyway, uh, my question is the how you make a difference between avatar, uh, because I'm still thinking about the avatar from like um, A and A type of the avatar, the moving object on top of that, they just put the, the uh, touch panel like iPhone kind of things and they, they call it as avatar. But at the same time, there is a teleoperating uh, robot like Orihime, which is also a avatar, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. the, and at the same time, for many people, still avatar is like uh, from gaming industry. Mm -hmm. It's really yeah. hard for everybody to grasp the, uh, and also uh, from the films from America and the, the anime you mentioned, the ghost industry, I'm always talking about. Mm -hmm. so it's really hard for everybody to grasp the, the actual idea of the what is actually the avatar and also um so if you can and also the thing in japan is that uh, we also many people are still in favor of virtual so that um, um big companies are actually start using virtuals to promote their own products on in the um internet world as well so it, i'm really getting confused how you actually define the avatar is it very I should narrow it down to the smaller scale, or I should think with the big pictures, and everything is avatar, and I'm still confused. Yeah, that, that's very... Yeah, uh, Joe, yes, real quick. I was just yes, going to say, you mentioned that there were parallel meanings of avatar, so maybe the question would be, like, what are those, like, if there's three different basic meanings, maybe it would help to have a definition of what is being called avatar, if, that, if I understood you correctly. Yes, thank yes. you very much. Yes, thank you, Tomoko and team. Uh, yes, absolutely. There, there are different ways. Um, uh, avatar has been maybe a word that has been overused, uh, I would say. And there, there are different industries that are taking this this word borrowed and uh, they, they want just to do uh, what the product or service is and name it avatar. But if, if I can, let's zoom, zoom out a little bit and if I can put an analogy of this avatar, maybe it would be like cars. Like when you say, oh, this is a, that's a car, but it's like a sport car, it's like a agricultural car, it's like a golf car. <laughs> so so there are now many different kinds of avatars. I, I, don't, I don't want to say too many, but different. As you perfect that in the game industry, for instance, uh, Nintendo has very well uh, uh, put itself into this. Uh, your, you have to have your character, your own character, for instance, as an avatar and also uh, in different games, not just uh, uh, once in games. And also there are some business uh, uh, like services that you have to have your avatar. So in this context, the avatar is kind of like your digital representation in that precise service, including games. So you have a, a, like a picture, instead of having a picture, you have a, an avatar in, in which is a digital semi animated, semi-animated uh, character that uh, in, like makes a connection with the different services inside uh, that company, could be Nintendo, could be etc. other ones. So so that's one meaning. Uh, so Ghost in the Shell is kind of one correlated meaning of, of Avatar. Another one is uh, the digital representation. You can see like a, a, an enhanced, enhanced picture of yourself into the service, in one service. And another one is this uh, like what ANA has been doing with the avatarine, in which they have a telepresence, telepresence robotics. Uh, they are pushing very, very much in branding these telepresence robotics as avatars. So, so I, in Japan, what I can see is these three main cl clusters of definitions: the ones related with the ghost in the shell, the ones related with the uh, semi, semi uh, animated personal digitalization of yourself. Uh, like uh, services like Nintendo, for instance, in Nintendo Wii or Pokemon. And also the third one is the ANA, the avatar, which they, is a tele telepresence device, robotics. So that's, uh, uh, I, I would say, the three main clusters that uh, we have here in Japan of the definitions of avatar. So the, the concept of avatar, it's maybe uh, being defined. We are in the middle of the, the rewriting the definition and Japan has its own strong strengths and its own forces, but also in the US as well, like uh, 
um, this cartoonic animated personalization also exists in the 3D virtual worlds as well, uh, especially in games, uh, but also Avatar the movie in America and Avatar X Prize. So I think those are the three different uh, super clusters in US of the definitions. So three main definitions that overlap in America and three definitions that overlap in Japan. And there's one, there's one that overlaps very well the Japanese and the American, which it would be like the digital representation of yourself into a service or a, a digital environment. So that's maybe the most common uh, overlap of the one of the definitions of America and one of the definitions of Japan of Avatar. But uh, it's a multi. That's that's what I I, uh, I wanted to talk. It's a multicultural, multi-temporal meaning of Avatar. So it's something that is evolving in real time. Uh, so so many industries are borrowing this catchy catchy name because it's, it's kind of an interesting name, Avatar. It's easy to remember, it's easy to pronounce, it's easy to use. So uh, usually it contains any kind of digital per, digital characteristic. So I would that, I would say that that would be the definition. It's like a digital characteristic of a humanoid personalization of a user or a person. So that's uh, the super general definition. But the application, like uh, the more a sub subsets or super clusters of definitions, uh, three in America, three in Japan, and there is one very one very clear that overlaps very well in both in Japan and US. But uh, uh, the ANA here in Japan, the Avatarin, they they took the inspiration from Avatar X Prize uh, in a way, and they develop itself inside ANA, and they spin off in a company uh, that they do teleoperation for. Uh, meetings or for any kind of social gathering. Uh, so you can, from your computer, you can control a robot that it could be far, far away and you can talk to people as if you were in that room with other people far, far away. So that's uh, the tele, tele, uh, the Avatar X Prize uh, product that they, they have developed. But, uh, but uh, in Avatar X Prize, the American version, it has more to be not just uh, moving a robot and not just seeing but what is, I think, important in the Avatar X Prize concept is the other senses, like um, touch is very important, and also a smell, if if that's possible. So this uh, uh, putting extra senses to the ability of, of teleoperating robots uh, is what may be characterizing the, the definition of Avatar X Prize in the US. So that's uh, uh, maybe <laughs> too much explanation. Uh, I wonder if that everything makes sense. Uh, yeah, thank you. And then I'd like to ask one more question about uh, how you define the thing, like um, the the um, the robot or very. I'm sure you know a uh, professor is Igora from uh, Handai Osaka University in a robot, right? Yes, he, yes. Yeah, he wants to upload his brain so that he can live for centuries, something like that. He said, well, he, he, he has his avatar with himself, he looks like himself, and he is now having the plastic surgery to look younger because his android itself is more expensive than himself nowadays, according to him. <laughs> right. so, he, so he can change the skin of the, the android so that he needs to look younger to look the, the thingy he made. Otherwise, it just doesn't look like himself. And he was really trying to, uh, trying to give the presentation by his presentation, by using his avatar. Mm -hmm. And the university is still, no, five years ago, I think, the university defined um, to pay his salary based on his presence. Even the, the um, if he's giving the presentation or giving the lecture at the university, he is being paid. But if he's the creature is giving the presentation, he's not giving any salary. That's the definition by the university at five years ago, as long as I heard. So the, it's, but it's, it's still like an avatar, right? Yes, yes, it is. It is. Uh, uh, Ishiguro Sensei, uh, his avatar is super interesting. I heard that even the hair, the hair is his own hair, uh, the hair of the avatar. I, I don't know. <laughs> that's I don't what know. I heard too. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. But uh, uh, 
Yeah, basically, it's a teleoperated robot uh, with his own face when he was younger uh, and his own uh, movements. And it's very personalized, uh, uh, the muscles that he had at that age and uh, the proportion of the face, etc., etc. So that that teleoperated robot avatar of his, of Ishiguro Sensei, it's amazing. I have seen it in real life. Uh, it's really, uh, it feels like, it looks like real. Um, and obviously anyone who it, the, the concept of the this robot is like you have a microphone in, in the different room and you can talk so any voice can can come from that uh, avatar from that uh, uh, technology uh, not just his but uh, uh, that's a very good example of an avatar uh, in uh, just at least for talking uh, many people would say oh that's not an avatar uh, but uh, as we say like it's a digital representation of yourself it belongs to the category of avatar, absolutely. Some people would be more more strict, saying, "Okay, can it move? By itself? Can can you move it? Can you move around with it?" And maybe as far as far as I know, it cannot move. Or for instance, can you touch things and can you feel them? Uh, as far as I know, she wasn't say robots, not yet. So, uh, some for some people, for some people who define avatar in a more strict way, they might say, "Oh, that's not an avatar." But they are, as we were telling, the definition of the avatar is kind of stretched now and has broader, broader uh, meanings. Uh, so I completely accept, and I think it's uh, inside the avatar definition, Ishiguro Sensei's robot. Uh, and it, an important point is like technology is catching up with the concept of avatar. So, so this robot that he has, he can eventually put like legs for instance and he can walk or arms that they can move and if he's connected to the arms he can move exactly the same way the arms with the robot so this uh, uh partial complete multi-senses avatar uh, what ishiguro senses has uh, so uh, his robot can be upgraded and that's the thing that we see different pieces of avatars and they are kind of uh kind of very has a very nice function and very nice feature just in one vertical but there are others kind of avatars that are very good advanced in different feature so uh, we're we're seeing a kind of different kind of uh products or services uh that have a feature a special feature and all of them are claiming to be avatar and maybe if there's any personalization or in a digital way it, it can be an avatar the embodiment uh, in this case of, of Ishiguro Sensei's uh, robotics is a, a ro embodiment of himself. So he's kind of replicating or scaling himself. And that's something that uh, uh, it could be, it's one of the future main applications of, of teleoperations. For instance, you can have, a, let's say, 10 or we can say 50 or 100 teleoperated robots in the moon. Uh, theoretically, hypothetically, just one person could be controlling the 100 robots in the moon. For instance, if they have to uh, take away like sand or make like a, 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 a plane, like a, a ground, very plain, uh, one single person could control many robots. So in that way, you can scale yourself. Uh, in, you can multiply yourself, which is kind of the holy grail of, for everybody. <laughs> so if everybody, if oneself could multiply yourself, that would be excellent. Uh, but this, this, teleoperated avatars uh, have the potential of like yourself. So I, I think the concept of Shiguro Sensei, it goes in, in that direction. He's multiplying, scaling himself. So he can do different presentations, even one in Hong Kong and the next half an hour in San Francisco and an hour in Paris. <laughs> if he has the robots already there, he just connects to the internet and he can be partially there in, in these three different places almost at the same time, or it could be at the same time indeed. <laughs> so he could give exactly the same presentation in three different congresses and different meetings at the same time. So that's uh, the power of uh, teleoperated robots in, w in which she was say his category, I think it is the teleoperated robots. In this case, he he's just moves them out and the face and the eyes, but uh, eventually we will be able to do even more. And, and uh, this is, see, yeah, this, this laboratory is very exciting. I, I, I love it. I love it. I wonder if that makes sense. Thank you very much. Yes, Jovan, I have a question to you because uh, last time uh, you talked about uh, Avatar X Prize and today you mentioned it a couple of times again. So um, my question is, uh, what is the significance of this Avatar X Prize? And uh, well, there is a second question. Uh, 
too. So why is it important for startups or even companies working in robotics to participate in it? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes. There's a, a premise, uh, maybe like a philosophy. What I have perceived is that they can, they want to brand or to put X price as the same quality as a novel, as a novel price. So the X price, uh, the branding would be very like a, uh, prestigious as a novel, but it's in a different kind of category. For instance, novel is usually scientists that spends many years in a, inside the lab. And when I say many years, it could be really 30, 50 years. Uh, but in this X Prize, they don't have to be scientists. And I think that's the main difference. It could be anyone who has, who's brave enough to do innovation, to make an impactful change uh, by connecting technologies and disconnecting technologies to to make an innovation. So they are trying to brand themselves as a Nobel, Nobel Prize for for technologists or for engineers. So it's a Nobel Prize for en engineers. So that's kind of the objective in long, long term. But uh, it has been made a lot of progress. If you can see back in history, all this revolution of the space industry is really thanks to XPRIZE. The first XPRIZE was the, the uh, Ansari XPRIZE in which there has to be a competition when a team has to go twice to, to the space and come back uh, with the same vehicle in two weeks of, dif of distance. So this team, uh, there were different teams, for instance, uh, 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 this British, uh, British company uh, who recently launched rockets, they, they won the uh, XPRIZE. And the same technology they used for winning the XPRIZE, they are now using it for uh, launching rockets to, to the space. So that uh, the revolution of the space industry, if you can see it, obviously NASA has had to do a lot of with it, uh, supporting the engineers and et cetera. But the main uh, catalytic uh, uh, thing that happened was really Express. So in, in that way, Express wants to put the, their own step, their own seal in different things, for instance, in oil collection or in carbon, uh, carbon sequestration. Uh, they they want to do different things, uh, different industries. So they are kind of concentrating now recently in climate change. Uh, so so for a startup to be part of XPRIZE, it's maybe not that appealing in the beginning, uh, but when the startups realize that the importance of the PR and uh, what they can get, uh, it, it could be very valuable and they can get investments more easily and they can, uh, can contract and make more... Uh, get new new customers or potentially new many new investor investors uh, capital flowing to to the startup so i think it's very very good if a startup decides to not just go into an prize but also get into the semi finalists or the finalist uh, and the avatar prize is the what they want to do this transformation in the industry but for avatar uh, uh, the basic need was coming from a and a so they say like we want to disrupt our own industry which their own industry is like putting people from one place to another by airplanes. So they say, let they say, how can we disrupt ourselves? So there were kind of a brainstorm sessions in, in, in California, and then they come to, the, okay, what about if instead of physically tra transporting one person in an airplane, you digitally take one person into another place and the person doesn't have to move at all? So how? By avatars. So let's create a contest in which a, a person who is in their house, they certainly want to have a nice dinner in Rome, for instance. So you connect with your device, whatever it is, you have a robot there in Rome, and then you just, just walking around Rome, and maybe you can even sit down in the, in the table and possibly maybe having most possibly the same food uh, uh, if there's any kind of service that provides food from Italy to your to your house you can be eating what the robots should be eating uh, and looking around and you see around you're in Rome virtually but you're in your home so so that kind of uh, mindset uh, that kind of motivation was uh, how can they disrupt themselves and and this avatar X price takes uh, as I mentioned not just one sense which is usually the visual sense uh, but also the touching is very important and I think they they want also the smell in the future. So uh, the touching, how you can touch things and you can see, oh, this is soft, oh, this is rough. This is heavy, this is light. So if the robot can't make this difference, it provides the user an immersion that lets them feel like it.
the where? Jovan, uh, we lost you, I think. Okay. Oh. Ah, hello? <laughs> yes, we lost sorry, you sorry. For, for a bit. Okay. Well, that's it, well, I was... Yes, I mean, yes. because you're talking about ANA trying to dis disrupt itself and the industry. And ANA is a Japanese company, right? So we know that the word disruption here is not um, appreciated very much. And uh, But it's fascinating to hear what you're saying. And also for somebody who works in the travel industry, you know, to me, what you just said about uh, being able to experience uh, other places without traveling to those places immediately you know it rings a bell an alarm in my head that well it's really a threat for the travel industry <laughs> it's fascinating yeah just um, an observation now in my thoughts at the moment you know that's yeah. really interesting because i didn't know about this ana avatar so i was reading up you know on their website and maya you know that's a very interesting point it's uh, you know the alarm um so yeah, so Javon, so could you explain a little bit further why they're doing that again? Because you said, you know, your, your example uh, was for like Italian dinner. So if you can see and almost smell the meal that your avatar is having, you are enticed to fly over to Italy to explain, I mean, experience the meal w on your physical self. Is that a motivation of <laughs> ANA? Oh, I misunderstood you, which I no. often do. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, indeed, it could be um, not necessary, but maybe if you are motivated, yes. But what the main motivation was uh, for ANA, ANA to provide, to scale themselves, for instance, uh, how much you need to go to Italy, uh, let's say $2,000, uh, a round trip flight, uh, plus the hotels, plus the time, etc. So you are coming from work and you say, okay, I just want to go to Italy tonight. Uh, so that kind of accessibility and scaling and it's not just for instance the capacity of an airplane but it could be the capacity of all tokyo uh people living in tokyo for instance uh, going the same place with just one robot in an italian restaurant could make the the same service for millions of people here in japan so that that's kind of the the way of scaling uh, instead of selling one round trip ticket from a and a they can say they can sell like one experience robotics dinner in prom for maybe fifty dollars, so fifty dollars by twenty million people, it maybe it's better than two thousand dollars by two hundred people, for instance. Let's say and big airplane. So, so I, I got think, okay. I didn't know. I thought that this avatar was for free service, but they're charging for it. Okay. Well, this the, uh, well this this example is something that I just invented. It doesn't exist. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 But yeah, that, yeah. But it's <laughs> if coming. They, obviously. If doing that, yeah. I think it makes sense though if they're doing that because, like you said, you know they're killing their own business, which is transportation. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if you are charging for the experience, uh, that's that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that that's that's why uh, they wanted to disrupt themselves. That how how can we? Uh, because the rationale about disrupting yourself comes that there's going to be somebody else who's going to disrupt you sooner or later. So there's <laughs> <Indeed>. <laughs> yeah. The, so so what about if we disrupt ourselves? Uh, how can we do it? So they they did the process of, of understanding what the core business is. And then they brainstormed with these people in, in next prize in California. And then they came with this, okay, what about avatars? Uh, instead of physically take, taking you from one physical place to another physical place, let's take you digitally. Uh, so you, you have almost, I mean, it's not gonna be almost, but kind of close, if it's possible to have a close experience as you're looking for, uh, if we can provide it easily, more accessible, more affordable, Etc. Uh, without having to do so many things of uh, now you have to get a test and you have to do so many paperwork, etc. And the time that it takes just to have a dinner in Rome. So, mm -hmm. so, so many things uh, and it's costly, etc. So you can save a lot of pains from the user, from the persona and just transport them right away to the experience they really want to, to have. So that, that's what we should be investing in. Mm -hmm. So this avatarine, uh, the spin-off from ANA, they have, uh, this is kind of the first step, I believe, uh, there might be coming later more iterations from ANA, okay. and uh, I'm excited to see what's going to be the next spin-offs we related with Avatar from ANA. Yes, the main, you know, what is fascinating to me is that basically ANA is trying to create the future, and because they are not waiting for anybody else to do that for them, so that they have to adjust, basically they they create the future so that other people can come into the game later. But ANA is going to set the rules of the game. So this is really very progressive. And um, it is, in the beginning, it sounds counter um, counterintuitive when you say, well, let's disrupt ourselves. But by disrupting our, themselves, they 
indeed in the long term they're going to be the the game setters and the game makers at the end of the day and that is fascinating i think this is for me personally this is the bigger lesson of this because we know that technology is developing at a very fast pace but uh, the ability you know to think not just uh, for tomorrow or next week or next month but think you know about the the future in the long term is very important and i think personally for me this is the lesson of what you have just uh, talked about jovan nice thank you thank you maya yes uh, that's very very important like how you can create a future how you, you are in the possibility your co own company can disrupt yourself and create your future and be the first one to put this new service on this new product so that's the uh, kind of the the rationale of disrupting yourself absolutely so now uh, ana is actually fighting against um the ANA is actually is fighting the business with um, AR, VR, and um, MR industry. I'm sorry, which industry? Uh, um, a, VR, AR, and uh, MR. Yeah, I, what I would say is, is merging, merging, not just fighting, but merging, because AR, VR, it expands. Like maybe what, if I could say, just guessing what I want, want to say, but uh, maybe a and wants to concentrate, would like to concentrate just in the physical, real experiences, let's say, like they exist, like going to the inner room or, or Paris or whatever. Uh, but inside it, the virtual AR, VR, there are many other like unreal, like there are many unreal things, like being in the Harry Potter castle, for instance, or being in a different planet or whatever. Uh, there are some things that you will, they, they don't exist, they don't exist, so they will not happen very soon, like going to Mars for everybody. But if you can have a simulation of you being in Mars or uh, uh, being, in, yeah, being inside uh, something that you really like, uh, like Harry Potter Castle, for instance, let's just a couple of examples. So so there's so much market and so much more dimension, multi dimensions in the AR, VR, uh, but maybe if ANA can just concentrate in just these kind of uh, current experiences that they know their users want to have, that's why they travel. So, so that maybe can make a very narrow niche that they could just become the the default or the experts or the main providers of this service, for instance. That that's just guessing a lot, but uh, uh, that may be some kind of reality there. Yeah. See, I am very cheap, and I don't think I'm paid for fifty dollars for the experience. But okay, that's sorry, that's that's me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's uh, almost uh, ten past nine. So uh, let's. Yes. let's Yes, I don't want to keep you any longer, Jovan, but we're definitely going to continue the conversation, uh, hopefully in January. So let's talk about it uh, after we finish the room. And um, so if you have anything to say in, um, well, in conclusion, mm -hmm. please let us know. Yes, yes sure. Well, uh, just basically to let everybody know, remember that uh, Avatar is a concept that is very easily taken by different industries and it's, it changes. It's not one single meaning is different meanings in different cultures and also in one single culture it evolves in different time time points so it's something dynamic avatar but basically what you can you should remember is like some kind of digital representation of a human so it could be a voice it could be movement it could be tactile it could be whatever but uh, there's some kind of digitalization in the process and there's a personalization of, of yourself the, the user so that's uh, uh, maybe the broad very broad definition of avatar well, thank you, everybody. I enjoyed it. Yes, very much. Tomoko-san and Yuka-san, thank you for coming up uh, for uh, the discussion. We're looking forward to having you up uh, again here. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, have a great day again, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for coming and staying with us today. We will be on air next week on Thursday at 8 a.m. Japan time, time again. So join us. Until then, you can find us at japanexpertinsights.com and our YouTube channel, where we upload all the conversations on Japanese politics, business insights, and the role of Japan in the Indo-Pacific region. If you want to stay informed about our upcoming events, you can follow us on Clubhouse, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Again, we're looking forward to your joining us next week. Until then, stay well and make the best of the day. See you.